So as the theme goes, it starts with us, right? And whenever we think about our own potential, or whenever we even argue about our potential, a lot of times, you know, things which come up are, are like, if it's in our nature, or is everything, you know, out there and we can just learn it? Do we all have the same potential? But if we do, then why do we differ in terms of our developmental trajectories? Why do people turn out to be different? Some people just inherit diseases from their parents. Some people sometimes do not inherit any disease from their parents, but they get those diseases without any particular risks. So there is this constant battle between nature and nurture. And today I'm going to talk about how nurture actually can alter the nature across generations in animals and humans. And the most important aspect of that is that this has implications which are not limited to, to a particular animal or a particular individual, but this has implications maybe for all of humanity. So when we talk about nature and nurture, nature is simply, you know, what we define as, as, as genetics. It's these four base pairs which we all inherit, right? The sequence of DNA. That is the nature. Or that is what we call genetics. But then there's something on top of that known as epigenetics, which is nurture, which is the influence of the environment, how it shapes not the sequence of the DNA, but actually how that is translated. So between the DNA and the proteins, there are different levels of regulation. And that is where epigenetics or the environment or the nurture, whatever term you want to use, plays its role. So it is the study of changes in gene function expression which do not involve changes in the DNA sequence itself, but how it's expressed. The most important thing is that this is something which is heritable. So when one cell divides into two cells, whatever is happening at the nurture level gets transmitted to the next cell. And what I'm going to show you throughout this is that this is also heritable when it comes to generations of animals and humans. Now this epigenetics, as I mentioned, is transmissible, right? So what actually happens is that here you see the very first generation which gets exposed to a particular environmental insult. Now that environmental insult could be anything. It could be like, you know, I should not even use the word insult because it could also be something positive. So let's call it exposure. Now this exposure is leading to certain changes in all cells of the body but importantly also changes in the gametes, in the germline. And these changes then lead to specific manifestations in the offspring generation. Now, the offspring generation is inheriting this environmental exposure while not being exposed to it himself or herself. And then these changes get transmitted across many, many, many generations. Now, like I mentioned, this, this exposure can be positive, this exposure can be negative. And now we have concrete evidence that this inheritance at the epigenetic level, at the nurture level, it can be induced by positive exposure, such as exercise. So if the father is exercising, you know, the great grand offspring would benefit from that. By high fat diet, so if the parents, the mother or the father, if they are exposed to high fat diet, there would be a transmission of risk of diabetes or obesity in the offspring. What I'm going to talk in particular about is how effects of traumatic exposure can be transmitted across generations of animals and humans. And finally, similarly, we know this about toxins. The toxins also lead to these abnormalities at the phenotypic level which can be transmitted across multiple generations. So when we think about the epigenetic inheritance of trauma, our work in particular, we know that the traumatic insult, it's happening at the level of the first generation. It is leading to some molecular changes at the gametes. Um, these changes in the gametes, they get translated 
into the first offspring generation and they become persistent. They are also going to be present in the gametes of the first generation so that they are transmitted to the gametes of the second generation. How did we find all this out? So we found out by studying um, a mouse model of early life trauma and what we know from experiences as well as from scientific literature that the worst form of trauma, the most severe of form of trauma is impairment of parental care early in life. So in this model, we study impairment of parental care in the form of what we call MSUS. It's maternal separation combined with unpredictable maternal stress. So in this model, we study mice, little pups, newly born pups, which are separated from their mothers early in life, in the first two weeks of life. Now during the same time, the mother undergoes something very stressful. So mice, they, they do not mind water actually, they, they, they can even swim, but what they feel really stressed about is when the temperature of the water is cold. So the mothers have this stressful exposure and they are separated from their pops at the same time. Now the combination of these factors, it's very severe. It's, it leads to very severe traumatic stress and impairment of maternal care. And when these little pups, they grow up to be adults, they still are carrying the signature of early life trauma. And they show increased anxiety, they show increased depression, they show like a lot of different like, you know, manifestations at the behavioral level, but at the same time at the metabolic level. They also have different like cholesterol levels and everything which I'll briefly touch on. But the most striking factor is that these like you know adults who were exposed to trauma early in life when they reproduce, when they mate with naive mice, their offspring also carry the signatures of their own traumatic experiences and also show these multitude of behavioral manifestations as well as metabolic manifestations. So about these manifestations, literally the nurture, and in this case it's negative nurture, it's a negative experience, it's altering the nature of the offspring. So we all know that mice are nocturnal animals, they prefer staying in the dark, but due to that early life traumatic stress, as well as like you know the same thing which uh, is just transmitted to the offspring, what we see is that their nature is altered. They start spending more time in the light compared to the dark, which also implies risk-taking behaviors. At the same time, when these mice are exposed to cold water, like you know, they don't try to escape. Now, a non-depressed mouse, a normal mouse, would try to escape, but these mice do not, as if they've given up on life which is very similar to this tendency towards suicidality, which we see in severely depressed patients. Apart from that, their social interactions go down, their navigational skills go down, and strikingly, they also become more and more hostile. And this is something which is transmitted also across generations. So apart from these behavioral manifestations, we see changes in their whole body metabolism as well. We all know that there are two different kinds of cholesterol, right? There is HDL, which is the good guy, and then there's LDL, which is the bad guy. And what we see in these mice as well as their offspring is that there is a decrease in the good cholesterol, in the HDL levels. Now importantly, HDL is not only something which has a nutritional value, but at the same time it's the carrier of these epigenetic modifiers in the body. So what's happening is that there is initial traumatic stress working at the brain level, altering meta metabolism at the level of HDL in the blood. And then what we hypothesized was that, okay, if there are changes in this blood at the cholesterol level, maybe that's how the germline gets altered because blood is the direct communication between the brain and the gametes. So for that, what we did was that we the blood transfusion. We took the blood from mice who were traumatized early in life and we transfused that into control mice. Mice which were completely wild type, which were completely naive and had no trauma and we saw that the effects were again transmitted in the same manner across generations. Meaning that 
the blood and the cholesterol in the blood is the key epigenetic modifier connecting the traumatic stress in the brain to what's happening in the gimme for the germline transmission. Now all of this was studied in mice and the important thing was to see if there are implications for that in humans. Now there are some studies, um, especially of like offspring of Holocaust survivors, and they've seen increased anxiety in offspring of Holocaust survivors. But all of those studies, they were devoid of any molecular um, understanding or underpinnings. Um, and I actually validated the mouse model of this early life traumatic stress in a Pakistani population. Not because I'm from here, but for purely scientific reasons. And the reason for that is that if you want to look at nature versus nurture, if you want to look at genetics versus epigenetics, you have to study it in a population which is genetically very similar. Now fortunately for the study and unfortunately for all the uh, medical drawbacks of it, genetically Pakistan is a very homogeneous population because we have the highest rate of consanguinity in the world. So if we looked at the genome of all the people sitting over here, it would turn out that we are all distant cousins. Because our parents and their grandparents, they were like a lot of like these like um, intrafamilial marriages and because of that, like genetically, we are a very homogenous population. So that was the benefit of studying that in Pakistan. But then we needed a population in which we also see early life trauma in the same manner of compared paternal care. Um, and we identified a cohort like that in the SOS village um, across Pakistan actually. Now again, because of like, you know, um, I would say of, of our culture and how like, you know, the social dynamics work, we were able to identify a cohort which is very similar to the mouse model. Um, these are unfortunate children who lost their fathers early in life. The mothers were not able to raise the kids because of financial constraints and they had to be adopted by the SOS village. So they ended up with an exposure, what we call paternal loss and maternal separation, which is very similar to the maternal separation and unpredictable stress in the mouse model. When we studied um, these children at the neurobehavioral level, we identified that they also have altered anxiety, they have increased anxiety and increased risk of depression. It manifests either as social anxieties, um, as panic disorder, as school avoidance, as all these different manifestations which make their life very dysfunctional, unfortunately. And at the same time, we also found out that their good cholesterol, HDL, is similarly lower. Importantly, what we found out was that there was a correlation between the HDL levels, the good cholesterol levels, as well as their behavioral manifestation. So the children who have low HDL, they also do much worse when it comes to depressive symptoms. So it means that it's all a vicious cycle which is connected. Traumatic stress is leading to low HDL, and low HDL is transmitting that to the germline, but also feeding back to the brain possibly. Now, as I mentioned, that HDL is also a carrier of these nurture-related modifiers in the blood, in the circulation. We compared a lot of these specific signatures between the mouse model and the human model, and we found out that a lot of these changes were compared. It means that the nurture, which is activated by early life stress, it is conserved across species. And whatever we have found out in the mouse model is also applicable to humans, which is something very, very critical and also something very, very scary. But at the same time, we had started only one generation of humans, so we wanted to see if these changes in the blood could then be also transmitted to the germline. So we took the blood from these um, children who had very large traumatic stress and then we exposed the germline cells to this blood. And what we found out was that a lot of these changes in the blood can be transmitted to the germline, very similar to the mouse model. Importantly, when we did genetic manipulation, when we knocked out the lipid receptor, the HDL receptor from the germline, this all could not be transmitted anymore. So it means that now our pathway in which traumatic stress in the brain altering the HDL, the good cholesterol in the blood, 
that affecting the germline that had been validated and vindicated in two different species. Now, not all is bleak because what this research has allowed us is also to identify the windows of opportunity in which we can prevent all these, like, you know, disease susceptibilities, these bad effects to be transmitted. It starts from the parental level, where at the preconception level, maybe we can do more rigorous screenings, identify populations which are susceptible to transmit these negative effects to their progeny. With the advancement of science, we are soon to reach that stage where we would be able to do something at the level of conception. Maybe we can do like editing at the level of the, the meat itself so that we can remove these um, ugly signatures of trauma which are likely to be transmitted. And thirdly, at the offspring level, um, what we can do is that similar to how a doctor, you know, they always ask you about their family history, they, they ask you about their genetic history. I think we need to change that. We need to change the protocols. We need to also ask about the exposures of the parents. Like, you know, we've, we've found a new term called exposomics, and that is what we need to study in the patient population so that we can identify individuals who have trumps, who have inherited susceptibility because of certain exposures to their parents, and they could be treated earlier. Now, in the beginning, I mentioned that it starts with us, right? This research also starts with us. It is about us. It also ends with us. And if you look at the implications of it, it's not limited to this mouse model of early life um, maternal separation. It's also not limited to this human cohort at that source village. But it has implications which are far-reaching for all humankind. If you look at what's happening around us, if you remember what happened at the U.S.-Mexican border, where these little children, they were separated from their families, so practically they did exactly like you know what they shouldn't be doing. Now, like you know, what I would be, like you know um, would beg to say about this is that whoever did that to create a barrier actually destroyed all the barriers and exposed generations of humankind to this negative transmission of multiple disease susceptibilities and even behavioral maladaptations like hostility. So it's like you do something to protect yourself. Well, to protect yourself, but at the same time, you are creating generations of hostile enemies for yourself. If you look at all the hostilities which are going around us, all the orphans which, which are generated, I mean, they're practically generated by indulging in wars. So whatever we started in this mouse model, actually there are multiple human models of it, unfortunately, now. So as I mentioned that this is about us, right? Science is also about us. And I always say this to whoever I talk to, whenever I have like a gathering of young people like you, I always mention this, that science should be for humanity. Now science has spoken. The question is, is humankind listening? Thank you.